My name is Nick Dutch, and welcome back to my ma mammoth um, reading session for this season. This is Chapter 3 of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. Awaking in the middle of a prodigiously tough snore and sitting up in bed to get his thoughts together, Scrooge had no occasion to be told that the bell was again upon the stroke of one. He felt that he was restored to consciousness in the right nick of time for the special purpose of holding a conference with the second messenger dispatched to him through Jacob Marley's intervention. But finding that he turned uncomfortably cold when he began to wonder which of his curtains this new spectre would draw back, he put them every one aside with his own hands, and lying down again, established a sharp lookout all round the bed, for he wished to challenge the spirit on the moment of its appearance, and did not wish to be taken by surprise, and made nervous. Gentlemen of the free and easy sort, who plume themselves on being acquainted with a move or two, and being usually equal to the time of day, express the wide range of their capacity for adventure by observing that they are good for anything from pitch and toss to manslaughter, between which opposite extremes, no doubt, there lies a tolerably wide and comprehensive range of subjects, without venturing for Scrooge quite as hard hardly as this. I don't mind calling to you to believe that he was ready for a good, broad field of strange appearances and that nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now being prepared for almost anything, he was not by any means prepared for nothing, and consequently when the bell struck one, and no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes, ten minutes, a quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. All this time, he lay upon his bed, the very core and centre of a blaze of ruddy light which streamed upon it when the clock proclaimed the hour, and which, being only light, was more alarming than a dozen ghosts, as he was powerless to make out what it meant, or would be at, and was sometimes apprehensive that he might be, at the very moment, an interesting case of spontaneous combustion, without having the consolation of knowing it. At last, however, he began to think, as you or I would have thought at first, for it is always the person not in the predicament who knows what ought to have been done in it, and would unquestionably have done it too. At last, I say, he began to think that the source and secrets of this ghostly light might be in the adjoining room, from whence, on further tracing, it seemed to shine. This idea, taking full possession of his mind, he got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. The moment Scrooge's hand was on the lock, a strange voice called him by his name and bade him enter. He obeyed. It was his own room. There was no doubt about that. But it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and the ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened. The crisp leaves of holly, mistletoe and ivy reflected back the light as if so many little mirrors had been scattered there, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as that dull petrification of a hearth had never known in Scrooge's time, or Marley's, or for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped up on the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, Brawn, great joints of meat, suckling pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red, horrid, red hot chestnuts, cherry cheeked apples, juicy orange, luscious pears, immense twelfth cakes, and seething bowls of punch that made the, the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In easy state upon this couch, there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up high to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in, exclaimed the ghost, come in and know me better, man. Scrooge entered timidly and hung his head before the spirit. He was not the dogged Scrooge he had been, and though the spirit's eyes were clean, clean and clear, 
he did not like to meet them. I am the ghost of Christmas present, said the spirits. Look upon me. Scrooge reverently did so. It was clothed in one simple green robe or mantle bordered with white fur. This garment hung so loosely on the figure that its capacious breast was bare as if disdaining to be uh, warded or concealed by any artifice. Its feet, observable beneath the ample folds of the garment, were also bare, and on its head there was no more covering than a hoddy wreath set there, here and there with shining icicles. Its dark brown curls were long and free, free as its genial face, its sparkling eye, its open hand, its cherry voice, its unconstrained demeanour, and its joyful air. Girdled round its middle was an antique scabbard, but no sword was in it, and the ancient sheath was eaten up with rust. You have never seen the like of me before, exclaimed the spirit. Never, Scrooge made answer to it, have never walked forth with the younger members of my family, meaning, for I am very young, my elder brothers born in these latter years, pursued the phantom. I don't think that I have, said Scrooge. I am afraid I have not. Have you had many brothers, spirits? More than eighteen hundred, said the ghost. A tremendous family to provide for, muttered Scrooge. The ghost of Christmas presents rose. Spirit, said Scrooge submissively, conduct me where you will. I went forth last night on compulsion, and I learnt a lesson which is working now. Tonight, if you ought to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe. Scrooge did as he was told and held fast. Holly, mistletoe, red berries, ivy, turkey, geese, game, poultry, brawn, meat, pigs, sausages, oysters, pies, p puddings, fruit and punch, all vanished instantaneously. So did the room, the fire, the ruddy glow, the hour of night, and they stood in the city streets on Christmas morning where, for the weather was severe, the people made a rough but brisk and not unpleasant kind of music, in scraping the snow from the pavement in front of their dwellings and from the tops of their houses, where it was mad delight to the boys to see it come plummeting down into the road below and splitting into artificial little snowstorms. The house fronts looked black enough, and the windows blacker, contrasting with a smooth white sheet of snow upon the roofs and with the dirty snow upon the ground, which last deposit had been ploughed up in deep furrows by the heavy wheels of carts and wagons, furrows that crossed and recrossed each other hundreds of times where the great streets branched off and made intricate channels hard to trace in the thick yellow mud and icy water. The sky was gloomy, and the shortest streets were chocked up with dingy mist, half thawed, half frozen, whose heavier particles descended in shower of sooty atoms, as if all the chimneys in Great Britain had, by one consent, caught fire and were blazing away to their heart's desire. There was nothing more cheerful in the climate or in the town, and yet it was there an air of cheerfulness abroad that the clearest summer air and brightest summer sun might have endeavoured to diffuse in vain, for the people who were shuffling away on the housetops were jovial and full of glee, calling out to one another from the parapets, now and then exchanging a facetious, snowballed, better-natured missile, far than many a worldly jest laughing heartily, as if it went right, and not less heartily as if it went wrong. The poulterers' shops were still half open, and fruiterers were radiant in their glory, there were great round pot bellied baskets of chestnuts shaped like the waistcoats of jolly old gentlemen, lodding out at the doors and tumbling into the streets in their apoplectic op opulence. There were ruddy brown face and broad girth Spanish onions shining in the fatness of their growth like Spanish friars and winking from their shelves in wanton slyness at the girls as they went by and glanced demurely at the hung up mistletoe. There were pears and apples clustered high in blooming pyramids. There were branches of grapes made in the shopkeeper's benevolence to dangle from conspicuous hooks that people's mouths might water gratis as they passed. There were piles of 
filibus, mossy and brown, recalling in their fragrance ancient walks among the woods, and pleasant shufflings ankle deep through the withered leaves. There were Norfolk biffins, squat and swarthy, setting off the yellow and the oranges and lemons and the great compactness of their juicy persons, urgently entreating and beseeched beseeching to be carried home in paper bags and eaten after dinner. The very gold and silver fish set forth amongst these choice fruits in a bowl, though members of a dull and stagnant blood race appeared to know there was something going on, and to a fish went grasping round and round the little world in slow and passionless excitement. The grocers, oh the grocers, nearly closed, with perhaps two shutters down or one, but through these gaps such glimpses, it was not alone that the scales descended on the counter, made a merry round, made a merry sound, or that the twine and roller parted company so briskly, or that the canisters were, were rattled up and down like juggling tricks, or even that the blended scents of tea and coffee were so grateful to the no nose, or even that the raisins were so plentiful and rare, that the almonds so extremely white, the sticks of cinnamon so long and straight, and the other spices so delicious, the canned, candied fruits so caked and spotted with molten sugar as to make the coldest lookers-on feel faint and subsequently bilious. Nor was it that the figs were, figs were moist and pulpy, or that the French plums blushed in modest tartiness from their highly decorated boxes, or that everything was good to eat, and in this Christmas dress but the customers were all so hurried and so eager in their hopeful promise of the day that they tumbled up against each other at the door, crashing their wicker baskets wildly, and left their purchases upon the counter, came running back to fetch them, and committed hundreds of the little mis uh, of the mistakes uh, in the best humour possible, whilst the grocer and his people were so frank and fresh that the Polish uh, polished hearts with which they fastened their aprons might have have been their own, worn outside for general inspection, and for Christmas drawers to peck at, at if they choose. But soon the steeples called good people all to church and chapel, and away they came, flocking through the streets in their best clothes, with their gayest faces, and at the same time there emerged from scores of by-streets, lanes and nameless turnings, innumerable people carrying their dinners to the baker shops. The sights of these poor revellers appeared to interest the spirit very much, for he stood with Scrooge beside him in a baker's doorway, and taking off the covers as they their bearers passed, sprinkled incense on their dinners from his torch, and it was like a very uncommon kind of torch, for once or twice when there was angry words between some dinner carriers who had jostled each other, and had shed a few drops of water on them from it, and their good humour was restored directly. For they said it was the shame to quarrel upon Christmas Day, and so it was. God love it, so it was. In time the bells ceased and the bakers were shut up, and yet, yet there was a genial shadowing forth of all those dinners and the progress of their cooking in the thawed blotch of wet above each baker's oven where the pavement smoked as if stones were cooking too. Is there a peculiar flavour in which you sprinkle from your torch? asked Scrooge. There is. My own. Would it apply to any kind of dinner on this day? asked Scrooge. Though to any kindly given to a poor one most? Why to a poor one most? asked Scrooge. Because it needs it most. Spirit, said Scrooge, after a moment's thought, I wonder you, of all of the beings in the many worlds about us, should desire to cramp these people's opportunities of innocent enjoyment. I, cried the spirit, you would deprive them of their means of dining each seventh day, off the only day upon which they can be said to dine at all, said Scrooge, wouldn't you? I, cried the spirit. You seek to close these places on the seventh day, said Scrooge, and it comes to the same thing. 
I see, exclaimed the spirit, forgive me if I am wrong. It has been done in your, in your name. Or at least in that of your family, said Scrooge. There are some upon this earth of yours, returned the spirit, who lay claim to know us, and who do their, their deeds of passion, pride, will, hatred, envy, bigotry, and selfishness in our name, who are as strange to us as all the kith and kin, as if they had never lived, remember that, and charge their doings on themselves, and not on us. Scrooge promised that he would, and they went on, invisible as they had been before, into the suburbs of the town. It was remarkable quality of the ghosts which Scrooge had observed at the baker's, that notwithstanding his gigantic size, he could accommodate himself into any place with ease, and that he stood beneath a low roof quite as gracefully and like a supernatural creature, as it was possible he could have done in any lofty hall. And perhaps it was the pleasure the good spirit had shown in showing off this power of his, or else it was his own kind, generous, hearty nature, and his sympathy with all poor men, that led him straight to Scrooge, Scrooge's clerk. For there he went, and took Scrooge with him, holding to his rope, and on the threshold of the door, the spirit smiled, and stopped to bless Bob Cratchit's dwelling, with a sprinkling of his torch. Think of that. Bob had but fifteen bob a week himself. He pocketed on Sunday, Saturdays, but fifteen copies of his Christian name, and yet the ghost of Christmas presents, blessed his four-roomed house. Then up wrote Mrs. Cratchit, Cratchit's wife, dressed out but poorly in a twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons, which are cheap, and made a goodly show of, of sixpence, and she laid the cloth, assisted by Belinda Cratchit, second of her daughters, also brave in ribbons, while Master Peter Cratchit plunged a fork into the saucepan of potatoes, and getting the corners of his monstrous shirt collar, Bob's private property, conferred upon his son, an heir in honour of the day, into his mouth rejoiced to find himself so gallantly attired, and yearned to show his linen in the fashionable parks. And now two smaller Cratchits, boy and girl, came tearing in, screaming, that outside the baker's they had smelt the goose and known it for their own, and barting the luxurious thoughts of sage and onion, these young Cratchits dancing about the table, and exalted Master Peter Cratchit to the skies, while he, not proud, although his collars nearly choked him, blew the fire until the slow potatoes bubbling, and knocked loudly at the saucepan lid to be let out and peeled. What has ever got your precious father, then? says Mrs. Cratchit, and your brother, Tiny Tim and Martha. Want as late as, as last Christmas Day by half an hour? Here's Martha's mother. A girl appeared as he spoke. Here's Martha, mother, cried the two young Cratchits. Hurrah! There's such a goose, Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, my dear. How late you are, said Mrs. Cratchit, kissing her a dozen times and taking off her shawl and bonnet for her with officious zeal. We had a deal of work to finish up last night, replied the girl, and had to clear away this morning, mother. Well, never mind. So long as you are come, said Mrs. Cratchit, sit you down before the fire, my dear, and have a warm, Lord bless you. No, no. There's father coming, cried the two young Cratchits, who were everywhere at once. Hide, Martha, hide. So Martha hid herself, and in came little Bob, the father, with at least three feet of comforter exclusive of the fringe, hanging down before him. And his threadbare clothes, darned up and brushed, to look seasonable. And Tiny Tim upon his shoulder, alas for Tiny Tim, he bore a little crutch, and his limbs supported by an iron frame. Why, where's our Martha? cried Bob Cratchit, looking around. Not coming, said Mrs. Cratchit. Not coming, said Bob, with a sudden... declination in high spirits, for he had been Tim's 
blood horse all the way from the church and had come home rampant. Not coming upon Christmas Day. Martha didn't like to see him disappointed. If it were only a joke, so she came out prematurely from behind the closet door and ran into his arms. While the two young Cratchits hustled Tiny Tim and bore him off into the washing house that he might hear the pudding singing in the copper. And how did little, little Tim behave? asked Mrs Cratchit when she had rallied Bob in his credulity and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob, and better. Somehow he gets thoughtfully sitting by himself so much and thinks the strangest things you ever heard. He told me coming home that he hoped the people saw him in the church because he was a cripple and said it might be pleasant to them to remember upon Christmas Day who made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Bob's voice was, Bob's voice was tr tr tumultuous when he told him this and trembled more when he said that Tiny Tim was growing strong and hearty. His active little crutch was heard upon the floor, and back came Tiny Tim before another word was spoken, escorted by his brother and sister to his stool beside the fire, and while Bob turning up his cuffs, as if, poor fellow, they were capable of being made more shabby, compounded some hot mixture in a jug with gin and lemons, and stirred it round and round, and put it on the hob to simmer. Master Peter and the two um, ambiguous young Cratchits went to fetch the goose, which they soon returned in high procession. <laughs>